Hi, so today we're going to be talking about policy interventions that are available and trying to deal with the market failures that we discussed last time. So we begin by asking when a policy intervention is needed. Essentially, the presence of market failures justifies when policy interventions are required. And what's particularly interesting here is in our context that many traditional interventions don't work well for cybersecurity. So we're going to focus our efforts on three approaches that have had promise in correcting market failures and security applications. Certification schemes, information disclosure requirements, and intermediary liability. To begin though, we should talk about traditional regulatory approaches. There's a dichotomy between ex-ante and ex-post approaches. Ex-ante means trying to do something about the problem before the bad thing occurs. While in ex-post you live and let live, but as soon as something goes wrong, you assign responsibility for failure. In safety regulation, you have compliance regimes that try to prevent harm. Ex-ante approaches are preferred when the situation you're trying to prevent is so bad that you want to prevent it from occurring at all before it happens. You see ex-ante approaches used, for example, in nuclear safety regulation, because no one there wants to wait around for an accident to happen and then assign the blame. It's also worth noting that ex-ante approaches can be preferred whenever it's difficult to measure bad outcomes, as often happens in cybersecurity. In ex-post liability, you wait for the bad thing to occur, then assign liability to the party that caused the problem. Ex-post liability has been used extensively in many industries, such as the auto industry, but it has not been adopted in the software industry. Both approaches have significant drawbacks in our context. The ex-ante safety rules certainly promote a compliance uh, approach to security, which is okay so long as you're adopting the right measures. But that's the rub. It can be very hard to sometimes identify uh, a drift that may occur between the measures that are adopted and those that are actually preventing harm. Meanwhile, software liability certainly has considerable downsides. In particular, it could hinder innovation in the context of developing free and open source software. Arguably, much open source software development would stop entirely if those volunteering their efforts could be held liable for bugs they might introduce by accident. Furthermore, by introducing software liability, you may raise the barriers of entry to software development so that small firms may not enter the marketplace at all. So there's a real trade-off between innovation and security when it comes to the question of software liability. So what else might we try? There's a series of mechanisms that can be tried to remedy information asymmetries. One approach is to use certification schemes, which evaluate products independently to establish security. So while, maybe, while it may be hard for end users or customers to evaluate security, if you turn the problem over to an expert body who can pass judgment, then the information asymmetry may be remedied. The common criteria is an international standard for certifying computer security. It's been used for certifying the security of products developed for the US DOD and other militaries across the world. The system does, does work in that it goes, the products go through this, going through this method do have a modicum of security baked in, but you have to be careful with how the certification process is designed and implemented. There could be issues with the incentives for the evaluators. In some cases, the evaluation can be paid for by the vendor seeking a, approval and so vendors shop around for the evaluator willing to give them the easiest ride on the testing. That's effectively what happened in the case indicated by the picture in the middle of the slide. There's a pen entry device which has been common criteria evaluated to be tamper evident and yet despite successful certification researchers from Cambridge University were able to insert a paper clip to tap the board and read the pen as it was sent over the wire in an undetectable way. So the evaluation completely failed even though it was evaluated to, to be sure uh, to be safe, in practice it was shown not to be. So let's talk about some other certification schemes. It can be very difficult for users who visit their favorite search engine to distinguish search results as being good or bad. Criminals know this, and they often distribute malware by hacking websites that appear high in the web search results. Since people can't easily tell whether or not a website will harm them before they visit, they tend to get infected. In this context, we're looking to buy some shoes. Uh, the second result is Amazon, so that's good, but the first result is for a website called mbtshoestar.com, which upon inspection looks kind of dodgy. If we look more closely at the fifth result, uh, mbtsportsale.com, we can see that the website has been certified by McAfee Secure as a hacker safe, VeriSign Secure, and so on. These certifications are put in place as an attempt to sing signal legitimacy to prospective customers. But the problem is that if you look at the who is, you can see that the site is actually registered to somebody named Joe Susan, 
which is almost certainly a fake name, and it's registered, an, registered into an address in China. So the shoes you're buying here are most likely counterfeits. What's interesting is that they have, they have these seals in place, much like the legitimate uh, seller, Zappos.com on the left. The seals are different, but the goal is the same, to signal trust to the website. So what's a customer to do? Turns out that these seals are often abused by the bad guys. There's been research on these seals, which has found that criminals are attracted to set up, these, set up the seals in order to convey a false sense of trust. Ben Edelman from Harvard, Medi uh, Harvard Business School has looked at data from SiteAdvisor to find lists of bad websites distributing malware. He then looked at websites that signed up for trustee seals, finding that bad websites were more than twice as likely to buy, be trustee certified than good websites were. So what you have here are criminals who are co-opting the seal, where we end up with adverse selection where the bad participants are more likely to seek the seals than good, which is the exact opposite of the intended goal of certification schemes. The upshots that certification can help mitigate information asymmetries, but you must be careful in how you do it because the incentives of the certifiers will be taken into account. So I conclude by striking a somewhat more optimistic tone by noting that there are good seals out there. For example, the Better Business Bureau seal has been shown to do a good job of only certifying good websites. But for consumers, it becomes hard to distinguish good seals from bad. So let's turn to another strategy for correcting information asymmetries. Here's Louis Brandeis, a famous US Supreme Court justice who wrote that sunlight is the best of disinfectants. This philosophy underpins much of the transparency movement in vogue today. The approach is, the approach is promising for cybersecurity because often uh, when things go wrong, the bad outcomes can remain hidden from public view. Mainta mandating disclosure could shine sunlight on these unfortunate occurrences. We've already seen that for data breach requirements, all um, this all got started back in 2002 with a law passed in the state of California requiring companies operating in there, that state to disclose any breach of security that left a California citizen's personal information exposed. This, this clause was inserted into a larger bill at the behest of Deirdre Mulligan, pictured here, who was working with the state assembly at the time. She's now a professor of information at UC Berkeley. Somehow she convinced a legislator to insert a clause into the law and more, more miraculously it stuck. As a result, the past decade has seen a cascade of data breach reports, which has arguably been going on for years prior to the disclosure requirement, but now we all know. ChoicePoint was the first company that, to disclose as a result of the law, but now we're seeing many more companies, from TJ Maxx to Target to Sony and to Sony again. So now these laws are in the books, under consideration in many more US states as well as other jurisdictions. So what has been the effect of data breach legislation? Before, before the legislation, data breaches were not taken seriously as a risk by many companies. Now it's got the full attention of the boards at many companies. This, this illustrates a more general principle. Many hard security problems can actually be managed if we only measure the risks appropriately and assign responsibility for when things go wrong. Before the, re before the legislation, data breaches didn't meet these criteria, and so it seemed an intractable problem. Now the scope of the problem has been made abundantly clear, companies will spend will sell cyber insurance policies and firms know what they need to do in order to protect personal information they hold. So what other aspects of cybersecurity might benefit from greater disclosure? Financial fraud figures are often not reported, which makes it hard to estimate the true magnitude of cybercrime risks. Cyber espionage is fiendishly difficult to detect. And when it, and when it is, firms would prefer not to discuss what happened to them. Control systems that manage critical infrastructure may be threatened by hackers, yet we don't really know the true extent because reports have been sporadic and non-attributed. More broadly, a comprehensive and ongoing collection of data on cybercrime losses would help society rate its improvement in managing cybersecurity overall. The last intervention we'll discuss today is indirect intermediary liability. While you might expect that liability should always be placed on the party that imposed the harm, uh, there's no reason that this has to be the case. In particular, if the bad actor for responsible for the harm is beyond the reach of the law, and there's some other third party in a good position to, to detect and mitigate the harm, then you can use indirect intermediary liability to assign responsibility to an innocent third party. This may be an attractive solution for cybersecurity in that many mitigation strategies involve innocent third parties. For example, with computers and botnets, ISPs are in a good position to uh, observe when their customers are infected. Similarly, search engines can often determine if the results they are presenting distribute malware. So in these contexts, you might consider intermediary liability. 
Now, before I hear objections that liability is a non-starter, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, what I said was that software liability is a non-starter. Intermediary liability is different. In fact, in the U.S., there's a long history of using intermediary liability to cure, to cure many of the uh, ills transpiring on the Internet. So this dates back to the Communications Decency Act. In the mid-1990s, uh, it was set up. Section 230 exempts online service providers from liability for objectionable content posted by its users, but with a twist. The provision offers protection for those providers who choose to clean up results themselves. Providers were worried that if they removed any content, they would then become liable for any content they failed to remove. The CDA ensures that this is not the case. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act also exempts online service providers from liability for customers' actions, in this case, their copyright violations through a notice and takedown regime. Here, a firm gets a liability exemption only if they remove the allegedly infringing content when requested. Finally, the Unlicensed Internet Gambling Enforcement Act in the past in the mid-2000s requires payment processors to block credit card payments to known internet gambling sites. Okay, lastly, let's mention a brief word about the role of law enforcement. Certainly, an improved response from law enforcement and arresting more cyber criminals could help mitigate harms and deter would-be fraudsters. But this can only be part of an overall policy strategy, not the entire solution. This is because cybercrime is so internationalized that attackers can readily shift to more favorable jurisdictions. Much of cybercrime is carried out at a high volume, but with limited individual harm imposed, falling below the threshold that investigators will pursue. Only when crimes are aggregated does the total harm warrant a response. But performing such aggregation is hard. Finally, sig significant harm is imposed before the arrest occurs and the high indirect costs associated with cybercrime suggest a preventative approach is warranted. To conclude, market failures warrant a policy response. We have emphasized the importance of policies such as data breach notification, which makes measurement easier, as well as those policies which clarify who is responsible for when things go wrong. Together, these approaches could greatly improve the state of cybersecurity. Thank you for your attention, and goodbye.